So I'm honored to introduce Dennis, um, who has 40 years of management, technology, commercialization, and international experience. During his 30 plus years at NASA, Dennis wore many hats, program manager, systems engineer, international relations liaison for the space station. He managed a nearly $900 million NASA investment portfolio in commercial orbital transportation surfaces, commercial crew development, and collaboration and collaborations for the Commercial Space Capabilities Program. He is CEO of Ion Biotechnology, developing therapeutic technologies for cancer and infectious disease, and is volunteer president of the World Space Week organization. Help me welcome Dennis. Everybody awake? Good morning. It's a thrill to be here, not only to speak to you, but in the future home of, of Starfleet. Thank you very much. All right. Um, this is our first conference in San Francisco. I had to say that. So anyway, I want to talk to you about some very big ideas, looking back at the, the economics of business, uh, demand and supply. Sometimes demand is harder than supply. When we first uh, started the COTS program a dozen years ago, we hired a venture capitalist. And Jeff was talking about stools. Well, he brought a picture of a stool, too. And he said that business is a three-legged stool. You have to have a supply. You have to provide products and services, of course. And this is, uh, this is rocket science. Supply is hard. But you have to have a very strong demand for those products and services and money to lubricate the whole deal. If you've got the, the two legs of supply and demand, the money, the money will follow. And then... You know, your logo can go here. So, um, so this is the, the model that he used to educate us about understanding um, basic economics of a good business so we could do our due diligence on the COTS program. And so um, <clears throat> the monitor doesn't work, by the way, just for you high-tech uh, folks back there. Um, so some demand is harder than others. So let's look at the spectrum. Um, on the left, you have the Falcon 9. Uh, which we invested in as part of the NASA COTS program. There was no demand stimulation required. They had existing fairing, existing launch loads. They were selling into an existing market where the purchase of a launch vehicle is like buying a commodity. And, but they were competing on price. And so they did very well. Very little effort, just sales. Just sales. Ah, thank you. Um, except it just went blank again. Anyway. Ah, it's back. Thank you. Um, well, I'm sorry, let's, let me go back. I didn't finish the slide. And so then you drift over a little bit to the right, um, look at Planet. Again, these are all highly innovative companies. I love them all. Planet is selling into the remote sensing imagery market, an existing market, I certainly grant you. Um, but what they're offering is very low latency, the fact that you can see things changing daily. And so someone who's been used to buying imagery that's a year old, we'll have to think a little bit. Wow, how can I benefit from that? Eventually they'll get to that point and they'll buy. But my point is it takes an extra amount of hand-holding to get that market to realize it's a market. And at the extreme end, you get, uh, and I don't use the word extreme in any negative way, please, but uh, the companies like uh, Moon Express and the others that are being supported on the supply side by the Google Lunar X Prize and NASA's Catalyst Program. Um, are landing these great spacecraft on the moon, hopefully soon. Um, but the markets that they're going to uh, pursue really are new. And so there's going to be a greater amount of effort required to develop those markets. Now, there, I don't want to spend a lot of time on business theory here because uh, you all go to sleep, but uh, there's a great book, a great work, a great career by a man named Everett Rogers. He wrote the book called Diffusion of Innovations. It's worth looking at um, because he came up with the concept of the S-curve of adoption. He researched why Iowa uh, corn farmers were taking three to four years to adopt hybrid seed corn in the 40s. It wasn't just that technology is ready, use it. It took social interactions, psychological interactions. He looked at this very uh, holistically from many disciplines and tried to realize that there are the the idea of the early opinion leaders, the early innovators, the early adopters, the, the late bloomers, and so on. And he tried to put in the 
put this phenomenon, which he saw over and over again in many fields, into a, uh, a, a format that we can all use as we try to understand whether we're trying to be very disruptive innovators or just sell into an existing market. It's an important distinction to make. So um, enough on theory. Let's talk about some really big areas that, uh, and look at the demand and the supply side at a very high level. Uh, areas that I think could be very big in the future development of, of space. We'll look at LEO services, LEO fueling, and um, power. So let's talk about commercial LEO services. Basically, these commercial space stations. After the space station ends, all these folks are going to be in, involved. Some want to be uh, operational even before then, um, which is great. What are the kind of markets that they're talking about? talking about doing microgravity research for co commercial industry and for the government, talking about doing advertising, uh, naming rights, and all of those media things, uh, tourists, of course, and others. Let's just poke around a little bit at some of these and, and let me share some observations. And so I'm a big fan of commercial microgravity research on the space station. It, it, uh, microgravity's been around for a long, long time. This chart's a little old, but I mean, we've been doing this for 40 years. We've had the drop tower at Glenn. We've got sounding rockets from Wallops. We've got this, you know, uh, parabolic planes um, coming online. Are the uh, are, are the uh, suborbitals? Of course, we have something called the space station and future uh, future free flyers and so on. So this is nothing new, and we understand the benefits pretty well. Uh, and I won't belabor the point here of everything from protein crystals and growing 3D heart valves in, in space, and uh, life is, uh, is given a whole new window, genes expressed differently, you can do all kinds of fundamental understanding of, of life to produce better vaccines and so on and so forth, and materials as well. And of course, the holy grail of microgravity is manufacturing, and this is why made in space, and the ZB Lance fiber, and all these are very great examples of things to come. And so it's a huge space that has incredible rich benefits to a large sector of our society. But I was wondering um, a number of years ago why they weren't lining up at our door. Let's go back and think Everett Rogers here. I said, let's get some data. So I hired Booz Allen to go do a study to ask the addressable market. These are biotech and pharma researchers, agriculture researchers, material scientists, and so on. How aware are you of the benefits of microgravity to your industry? Are they not coming as in vast quantities because they just, they're aware and they say, I don't need it? Or are they just not aware? Well, guess what? They aren't aware. 60 out of 100 on a scale of 1 to 10 said, I'm a 1. I mean, they said, why are you, why are you talking to me? I'm a biologist. Shouldn't you be talking to astronomers and physicists? Seriously, they said this. Oh my God! This is this is this is tragic. This is scary. Um, the the marketplace is, doesn't realize it's a marketplace, and I'm not blaming anybody. I mean NASA and recently Casis and all the, pl the platform operators over many years have been doing a lot to try to educate the market. This was five years ago. It's moved a little bit to the right, but I doubt it's moved that much. This is an area where demand stimulation, I think, is going to be essential. The market could be huge, it could be transformative to Earth, but we're going to have to do some heavy lifting to educate the scientists out there that we can remove your gravity and stop convection and diffusion and buoyancy and all those things that are somewhat confounding in the, in the laboratory. So this is, an, I think, a clear area of demand stimulation that is needed. Um, and so on the Rogers scale, this is uh, subjective, of course, we're at, you know, 10%. At some point, you push the rock a little bit further up the mountain and you get to a tipping point. So this is not an insurmountable problem, but we're not there yet. So that's the message here. So let's talk about uh, other markets of uh, where commercial LEO stations are interested. Advertising, space sizzles, right? Everybody's using space in their advertising. You know, we're selling hamburgers and, and, and sneakers and underpants or whatever using space. But can you go from, um, from here to here? This is the question. You know, if you look at the chart, it, it has a, a fly-through. I thought that was kind of cute. Anyway, instead of a drive-through. Um, so this is a question. So um, let's look at the analogy of sports stadiums. 
A company, when it decides whether to spend 10, 20, 30 million dollars to slap their name on that for a couple years, it's a table lookup. They can understand the media impressions they'll get from an NFL or a major league uh, uh, team that's, that's housed there. They'll understand the number of people that are coming through that see their name up in lights and, and so on. And they can decide, is that a worthwhile thing? So now you come along, say you're a commercial space station company, I've got a station, I want to slap your name on it, you know, 50 million please. And they're gonna say, wow, that's great, but how do I put a value on it? How many media impressions will I get? You're gonna have a camera staring at my sign, but who's gonna go online and look at the station floating around the earth? So how do you, how do you de stimulate the viewer interest in that logo? So I think this is gonna be a challenge. Um, and so when you go back and rack and stack the markets, and I'm not trying to be negative, I just wanna throw a little healthy skepticism into the discussion. Commercial research, it needs stimulation, and oh, by the way, when the commercial stations come available, there will be no more free ride, which they get today, thanks to NASA. There will be no more free services, which they get today, thanks to NASA and the international partners. If you're running a commercial station, you wanna make a profit, you're gonna have to charge these folks. So not only do they have the cost of their payload, but the cost of the transportation up and maybe down if they need to bring something back and the accommodations on board. So it requires demand stimulation and the price is gonna go up. So just a word of caution, we need to work on that. Will the government be buying your services? Mm, maybe, NASA has not said it's gonna buy any uh, services from commercial space stations. Um, are we gonna have a human research program that continues? Of course we are, but we may have a deep space outpost. There may be other ways to get that done. So if you're banking on NASA being your anchor tenant, that might not be a fruitful, fruitful assumption. Advertising naming rights, we talked about that. It could be big, but it's just kind of hard to get that started because it's hard to quantify the benefit. Tourists, again, just like the commercial research they fly today, but there's gonna be added cost. You're gonna charge a, a ticket price for them to come visit your station for a few weeks. Um, so the cost will go up, um, and I think the, you know, the, the elasticity of that market might suggest that there's not gonna be a lot of initial demand until costs start coming down. So just something to think about. Now let's look at something else. Let's change gear now and talk about another market that may end up in Leo called Leo Fuel. There's a company called United Launch Alliance where we help on our, our program. They're building a, a Vulcan uh, launch vehicle in an upper stage called ASIS. ASIS will be very, very versatile. It can be refueled. And so what ULA has is a, something they call the CIS 1000, CIS Lunar 1000 Vision. It's on YouTube. You know, go, go look at it. Not right now. Um, <laughs> I saw you reaching for your iPad. Um, and so what they can do to summarize is they can launch the ACES empty. So you have the launch vehicle, an empty upper stage, and the payload. So they can carry more payload, um, offer a better service to their customers. They would refuel ACES in low Earth orbit and then launch the payload to GEO or wherever it's going. The fuel would come from, well, anywhere, really. And so they're looking at the moon as just a case study. Of course, the asteroids and other sources as well. Um, and the ACES has been designed also to serve as a tanker, as well with a Mastin kit, uh, Dave, are you here, to land on the moon. So it can provide the kind of services necessary to haul LOX and liquid hydrogen back to LEO where they can fill the tanks and then go. So um, they have even published a price. They said we will pay $3 million per metric ton and buy over 600 metric tons per year. I think that's for three, um, three long trips to GEO. Do the math, $600 million per year. So the question is, is that enough uh, to build a business case for a lunar base at the poles that mine this stuff, sell it to ULA, and make a nice profit? There's a lot of interesting ava information available on this. Here's a book by Dr. Paul Spudis and so on. So I just did a kind of a meta study. I threw the numbers I could get. How much of a mass of a plant do you need? You got humans scurrying around and with shovels, digging the stuff up. Um, and how do you transport that mass to the lunar surface? Anyway, make a long story short, the answer was not yet. 
It just doesn't work. It would take 13 years for this thing to uh, pay back its investment. But we need to challenge those assumptions. Do you really need humans scurrying around? Can just be robots? Can robots repair broken robots? How about getting all that mass to the lunar surface? I assume the cost of ASIS Zeus. Maybe it'll be cheaper in the future. New Armstrong, who knows? So all of these things where the answer kind of goes, eh. I'd say don't give up. Let's keep challenging the assumptions. Keep working them because one day, you know, it may close. Um, and talk about challenging assumptions. Maybe it doesn't even have to come from space. Twelve years ago on COTS, we got a very innovative proposal from Space Systems Aral for, we call it the water rocket. They'd stick a few in, in the ocean and a few of them might make it up to or orbit. You're only carrying cheap cargo. Why do you care? You want, you want two, launch three at a .67 reliability rate. Look at the, the uh, price. A metric uh, ton would cost a million. Remember, ULA was willing to pay three million. Um, this is probably more costly than they estimated, but it just gives you an idea that to solve that demand problem, many different sources are possible. So again, challenge assumptions. Now, if we can do fuel in LEO, and if we can do commercial stations in LEO, someday you may see this. And today you can see it in uh, Steamboat, Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Anyway, all right. On a lighter side. Okay, if you're under 30, answer the following question. Who's this man? Is there anyone here under 30? Okay, let's go up to 35. Who's this man? Oh, dear gosh. Hmm. All right, well, thanks for coming today. It was great. Okay, if you're under 40, can you tell me the name of this man? Houston, we have a problem. Okay, everybody, who's this guy? Okay, Gerard O'Neill. Oh, it's the 50s and overs. I figured it out. Be aware, this is one of the greatest visionaries of commercial space development in our history. Okay, <clears throat> any age, what's Jerry known for? The high frontier, space colonies, zillions of people living in colonies. This is kind of a su supply side. The colony is providing services for people to live. And who was paying for these workers? What were they working on? Space-based solar power. I think I know who answered that question back there. <laughs> um, we need to remember this. This is really important. Um, this was in the 70s. It cost you know, a, a gazillion dollars, and it was just a, considered a dream, but it was a very powerful dream. Um, but a lot has changed. It ain't the 70s anymore. Here's a you know, recent work by uh, John Mankins. Technology has changed. Launch prices have have plummeted. Look at the cost of the Falcon 9. Technologies, materials uh, have, are much lighter. You don't even need humans to build this anymore. Robots can build this. And so, again, we need to go back and constantly look at these things. Um, the average price of electricity varies. Uh, Australia, not surprising, pays a, a half dollar per kilowatt hour. The military uh, in remote bases might even pay a, a a dollar per kilowatt hour. Those are some potential price points. Go after the niche markets. Um, Alan Boyle, are you here? But in 2009 was this article about a company here in San Francisco that was selling to Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, they agreed to buy 15 years of uh, space-based solar power at a cost comparable to what uh, PG&E was paying for renewable energy. Now, was the company able to deliver? No, they had a supply side problem, but that's not the point. It may be existence proof, not even in Australia, but in the United States, that companies are willing to do this. So that's, it's a, that's an important point. But again, just like the lunar fuel, this business case sure has not closed yet. Um, AC, are you here? Another one. Um, Spaceworks did a study, and this was 2010, so it's seven years ago, that um, the first revenue satellite uh, was, was had three to four billion dollars, too much capital expenditure to sell price, to sell power at the price point you saw on the earlier chart. Again, that was seven years ago. We need to continue challenging the assumptions. Someday, you know, this, uh, this may work. So, so I think we have some challenges before us as a community on the very big uh, demand areas that could drive the development of space in ways we've never seen before. 
I think microgravity, we can do a better job as a community to educate the scientists in the addressable market, that there are many platforms that can help them get their products to market, especially the ones up in, the, up in Leo, um, that we need to really keep working on this, uh, this Leo fuel opportunity. ULA will buy, you have a customer. And then last but not least, space-based solar power. Reed O'Neill, look at some of the more recent work. There, this, this will close at some point, at some point. And so I think the community could collaborate on this. And let me get, just get a sense. If there was an open source platform that where you could go online and contribute a little of your time and energy to working any of these, who would spend an hour a week helping to educate uh, the scientific community about microgravity? Okay? Who would spend an hour a week helping to work the case for getting cheap LOX and liquid hydrogen into LEO and sell to ULA? All right, well, we've got some people there. And who wants to work on space-based solar power as a collaborative community effort? All right, okay, we've got some interest. This is something, Jeff, are you still here, that the Space Frontier Foundation might consider uh, doing under its auspices, but I really believe that the community can help push all of these big markets. So again, demand can be hard. Remember the three legs in your business plan. Understand where you, your customers are on that Rogers uh, S-curve and you might want to put a little more effort in to helping get to that tipping point. As a community, I think we can get to tipping points, but we've got to work a lot harder on these three areas that we, that we mentioned. And if we're successful, these could be big, empowering the whole uh, cislunar ecosystem for commercial space. So if there's time, I'll take some questions. Thank you. <laughs> and I can't see a thing. I'm like completely blinded. So excuse me if I go like this. Questions going once, going twice. All right, well then, thank you very much. Appreciate it.